Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers, grandmothers, stepmothers, motherly caregivers that uh, God has blessed us with. We thank God for all of you and for the gifts that he gives to us through you. Your love and the life that we all have comes from him through you. So thank you for your service to us. You may have heard this incredible mother's story this week about a woman named Halima Sise, who gave birth to nine babies, four boys and, or five boys and three girls on Tuesday of this week. And she has another daughter at home. Won't that daughter be surprised when that bunch of kids comes home with her? Well, all these babies do have a long way to go before they can get home, but they continue to make progress under intensive care. And I imagine Halima will have fun answering that question that many moms get. Who's your favorite? Which one do you love the most? And like most moms, I imagine she'll say something like, they're all, in their own individual ways, my favorites. I love them all the most. What a great word to say. I love them all the most. Because that's exactly what God says to us. <laughs> Through John's spirit-filled words to us, he calls us to do this. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and his, obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. And what are these commandments that John speaks of? Well, in our gospel lesson today, Jesus tells us, he says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Love one another. Love all the brothers and sisters. Not just a few of them. Not just the ones you like. But love all of them the most. John's message to the first century church is a message of reassurance to God's children. And it's the same 2,000 years ago as it is today for us, for God's children in the 21st century. Despite all the challenges to the truth of God's Word and to our faith, challenges that seem to swirl around us like a Category 5 hurricane, threatening to tear our faith apart, John encourages us to hold fast to our faith because we know God. We know that he calls us his children, his beloved children, which makes all of us brothers and sisters in Christ as well as brothers and sisters of Christ. We know that even though we are sinners, deserving of all that that implies, that because he loved us first, we can return our love to him by freely loving others as he commands. Not just in word, but more importantly, in our actions and deeds. This love is not selective. This love is indiscriminate. It is comprehensive. It is complete. God says, love all of them the most. Loving all of God's children, our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, is yet another way that we know that we are indeed children of God. By this, we know that we love the children of God 
when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Yet, that is not what the world tells us to do, is it? The world likes to divide and conquer. It likes to separate the wealthy from the poor, the influential from the unimportant, white collar from blue collar from the unemployed, the beautiful from the ugly, the strong from the weak, black from brown, from yellow, from red, from white, foreign from the native, us from them. Even in the church, these divisions take place. Even in this congregation, fissures like this are present. With these divisions in place, then, the world tells us who to love and who to turn our backs on. And when this happens, Satan desires nothing more than us than to think that we're better than others, that We're more devout, that we are more deserving of God's grace. Or for some of us, maybe even not in need of God's grace because of our self-righteous, self-perceived perfection. You see, the world wants us to pick our favorites while limiting our love to those we like. But this isn't what God's eyes see. God sees a world that is filled with people who have all turned away from him. It is a world filled with people of whom God's word says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God sees his people. It's a world filled with people created in his image. People that he loves, but also a people who must pay a price for their disobedience because the wages of sin is death. Yes, God is a loving God. Make no mistake about that. But he is also a just God. A God who cannot simply ignore our disobedience. Who cannot, like the world does, condone our sin and look the other way. Perhaps you're familiar with the C.S. Lewis book, The Lion, the Witch, and the wardrobe. In this beautiful story, uh, a character called Mr. Beaver meets up with some children named the Pevensies who are new to this fantastic land called Narnia. And he begins teaching them about this land, including their king, Aslan. Aslan represents Jesus in this story that's called an allegory. And as he teaches them about Aslan, he says, Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, says Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I should feel rather nervous if I were to meet a lion. Safe, says Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He is the king. It is true, I tell you. God is anything but safe, but he is also good. He is loving. God demands justice for our disobedience. 
a justice that allows his creation to be redeemed. A justice that allows him to once again dwell fully with that creation. And so, out of pure love for that creation, for all of us, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. God sent his son, Jesus the Christ, fully God and fully man, to save us from the eternal effects of sin and death. But how do we know this? How can we be sure of this promise from God? Well, since the very earliest days, God has put it into his word that the testimony of two or three is required to confirm a charge. And so, as Jesus was baptized in the waters of the Jordan, his Father in heaven testified for all to hear, You are my beloved Son, and with you I am well pleased. And then Jesus began his ministry in the world, proclaiming for all to hear that the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The man Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, healed the sick. He forgave the sins. He rose, raised people from the dead. And as he continued his ministry throughout the land, he carried the sins of the world with him to the top of Mount Calvary. All sin from across all the ages, from the time of Adam and Eve to today, our sins, yours and mine, as well as the sins of all those who are yet to be born. There, the Son of God suffered and died to pay the price for all of these sins. And as he died, a Roman executioner ran him through with a spear. And we hear that water and blood gushed out from the gaping wound as God's only son hung dead on the cross. And as he died, the covering on the Holy of Holies in the temple was ripped in half from top to bottom. Rocks split in half. Tombs opened as dead people rose to new life. Even the sun's light failed to give its light. And seeing all of this, a Roman centurion testified, Truly, this was the Son of God. <laughs> Three days later, Jesus rose to new life. The apostles, witnesses to all of this, inspired by the Holy Spirit, recorded everything. And they did so that we too could believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. For, as John writes, there are three that testify the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree. By the power of the Holy Spirit, received in the waters of our baptisms, we believe that Jesus is, in fact, the Christ. And the good news for us is that everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And the good news continues. For everyone who has been born of God 
overcomes the world. God, our Father, through His Son, Jesus Christ, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, enables us to overcome the world, to overcome the world's divisions. No longer do we see with eyes darkened over by hateful evil. Rather, we now see with eyes enlightened by the love of Christ. And it's because of Jesus, the Christ, we are forgiven for the times when we allow the world to overcome us. For the times that we limit our love to those we like or limit our love to times that are convenient for our own person. Cleansed by his blood, shed on the cross, the Spirit strengthens our faith bit by bit, day by day. He enables us to grow more and more capable of loving all of God's children, loving them all the most. Christ's victory becomes our victory as we overcome the world. And we overcome the world by rejoicing in the life and the hope and the forgiveness that we have received in Christ. We overcome the world by remaining faithful to Christ and His commandments to love one another despite Satan's repeated attempts to divide us and conquer us. We overcome the world as we joyfully, in selfless and sacrificial love, use all of the gifts that God has given to you and me to serve all in need. We overcome the world by enduring hardships and difficulty imposed on us by the world, despite or without bitterness, despair, or envy. And finally, on the last day, we will overcome the world having faithfully loved everyone the most as we are raised from the dead to new life in the new creation, the eternal kingdom of heaven. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.